Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We uh, still have some time. It's still uh, 6.50. Before uh, we begin, I, I'll give a brief introduction of both of the uh, panelists. So, Dr. Uh, Prashant was a senior in residency. He was a... And following residency, he has been to Korea for his uh, clinical fellowship in... Uh, shoulders and knee at, at the Seoul National University and uh, following that he's been a research fellow at the Johns Hopkins Institute of uh, Medicine. Dr. Nikhil Gokhale was one of the people I spoke to personally while planning my own fellowship. Hi, Prashant, how are you doing? Hey, Nandan, how are you doing, ma? Not too bad. I was just giving a brief introduction about your own uh, CV and your journey so far after residency. And that's when I saw your request. Essentially, I was saying that you were a senior to me right from residency. And then <laughs> if you've been to places including Korea and USA. So, and I believe that you would be a perfect person to talk about the hurdles on the way, the path that you took, the additional exams that you gave. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat box if anyone has any particular questions directed towards either of the panelists and we'll direct them towards you guys. Still waiting for Dr. Nikhil to join. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yeah. Love okay, it. awesome. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. So thanks for having me and uh, it's fun to be here and I hope that uh, people learn a thing or two about uh, fellowships. Uh, with our experience and I believe that uh, you do not need an introduction but you have been through a whole process uh, of fellowship yourself. Uh, I believe you're currently doing a fellowship right now. So it would, uh, I expect this to be like a more of a discussion between three people sharing their experiences. Is it right? Coming from the same background, uh, if I would say. Yeah, for sure. But then, you know, somebody would have to play the role of a moderator, keep an eye on the chat box. And obviously you guys have reached your end point, whereas I'm still in a in the fellowship itself so you know I'll, I'll do that i'll i'll do that role absolutely you're the boss i don't think so but okay <laughs> <laughs> so we are also uh, co-streaming to ortho tv so in case uh, any of your uh, co-residents or colleagues miss out on the live recording it would be available for viewing later with uh, ortho tv ashok sham sir has kindly agreed to share it on that platform. So, yeah. Sounds, sounds wonderful. Thanks. I'm just uh, trying to see whether Dr. Nikhil is available. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Nikhil. At the outset, I would like to thank both of you for uh, taking time from your busy schedules and joining me on this. Uh... Hi, Nandan. Can you see me? Hear yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. I can see you and hear you loud and clear. The connection appears to be a bit sketchy because there is a bit of a lag. Can you see me, Nandan? Hi, Dr. Nikhil. I, th I think there's some problem with the connection at your end. It looks a bit sketchy. At mine. Okay, I'm just going to try again. Once. So, Nandan, I can hear you very well. I can see you very well. Is it the same on my end? Yeah, yeah. No problem. Okay, cool. So, uh, until until the time Nikhil joins us, so uh, where, where are you? Which city are you at right now? And what is the temperature there? So, I'm in Toronto right now, enjoying the summer months. We're done with the winters. The temperature is 20 to 30s, which is essentially mild by Canada standards. No complaints. Right. 
<laughs> I get it. So what is what is until he joins, you know, uh, what is like the lowest temperature you have suffered outside India? I mean, I believe you lived in South Korea, you lived in uh, Canada, which is pretty bad. So the uh, it the question. Like, Can you both see hey, me? Finally. Oh yeah, this is much better. Much better. Fantastic. Thank you. We were just having a general discussion about the weather in Canada and <laughs> till you till you join here and okay. So now must be both spring time, here, isn't it? If I'm not wrong. Yeah. Essentially, summer months, good times, and yes. no snow. Yeah, <laughs> it 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 sure looks pretty when you're away from it, but I I, I wouldn't want it. No, I wouldn't I, want it. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I would do without snow. Yeah. So at the outset, I'd like to thank both of you for joining on the channel and agreeing to talk on this topic. So I, I believe it's very useful for uh, all the young guys and the people in residency, especially uh, given the COVID pandemic and how it has operate, uh, affected operator work or cutting, if you may call it. And, you know, we, we I believe, did our share as residents, which was really what KM Ortho was all about. But I don't think the present batch I believe did our that exposure. So the fellowships assume that much uh, even even a greater importance so I, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction for both of you and then we can start off with the discussion so dr prashant was a senior resident when i joined and had the opportunity of working with him in mmd unit good six months i must say and following that he's been to south korea where he had a fellowship focused on knee as well as a research fellowship focused on the shoulder at the Johns Hopkins Institute of Medicine, USA. And Dr. Nikhil, again, undergrad, postgrad with KM. I did not actually work with him during residency, but have always asked him for guidance when it comes to fellowships and deciding the next path in career. He was a knee fellow with the Exeter Knee Reconstruction Unit in 2019 and a Joint Reconstruction Fellow at the uh, Royal North National Orthopedic Hospital at Stanmore in UK, following which he was a Shoulder Fellow at the Royal Bournemouth Hospital in 2020 and 21. Currently, he's a Visiting Consultant at Hiranandani and Nanavati, as well as the Mumbai Shoulder and Knee Clinic. Essentially, we have two doctors from India who traveled the world, did some prestigious fellowships in some nice institutions, and have now reached their end point in terms of practice and are just beginning off. So, wonderful journey, I must say. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Nandan. And uh, I'm uh, very happy to be here and uh, uh, to share whatever little I can in terms of uh, whatever experiences I have had so far. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, when I was uh, freshly uh, passed out as a uh, MS postgraduate, I remember feeling uh, quite half-baked in terms of uh, what I uh, could do uh, as measured against what I wanted to do. Uh, also, uh, you, you tend to feel like a uh, rudderless ship because uh, the formal training is pretty much over and uh, you you feel uh, that you're pretty much on your own and you have to, you know, uh, carve out a path for yourself after that. So I, I hope that uh, 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 my experiences and Prashant's experiences uh, can help the youngsters, people who are doing their post-graduation, people who've just passed out and can help them in uh, deciding the course of their professional and personal life uh, uh, in the near future at least. I am sure that Prashant and you. Yeah, no. yeah uh, thanks so much for the great invitation uh, and uh, the great uh, introduction, I would say. Uh, one of the things which I think the why this discussion is important is because uh, as a resident, no one really sat us down and told us, okay, what are you going to do for the future, right? When you are right out of, out of a residency, we just did not have that knowledge. So uh, it's a great initiative by you. We really appreciate it. And I hope that it helps out our residents to at least have a direction of what to do during their residency in order to land a good uh, or a decent fellowship. So yeah, thanks. And let's, let's get started. Sure. So the first question which I want to direct towards both of you is how did you zero in on a particular subspecialty? Like we rotate with different guys 
six months, one and a half year, probably in your parent unit. So, was the subspecialty that you chose similar to what you were exposed to in your parent unit, or was it something else? Do you want to go first, Prashant? Yeah, yeah, Prashant. yeah, okay, absolutely. <clears throat> All right, so uh, uh, I would I would like to give like three main criteria which every resident should follow during their residency in order to decide which subspecialty they want. The first important thing is that uh, you have to choose, you have to choose the line of work which you love, absolutely. Uh, one of my great mentors uh, told me that there are two decisions in life which are extremely critical, which decides your quality of life. First is your wife uh, or your husband. And second is your, uh, you know, what you do for work because you sleep with them and you get up with them and you, that's what you do for 18 hours of life, which you, which you are up. So to make sure that you take those decisions very wisely. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, in that terms, uh, first is that you have, you must choose what you love and you must marry, uh, uh, you know, whom you love. So that's very critical. So don't, don't base that choice on uh, what someone told you is good in terms of market uh, value or in terms of how much money it is going to give you, or just, don't, you know, don't, don't think about all this materialistic things. You've got to love it. Number one. Uh, so make that decision based on that choice. Uh, second thing I would say is that uh, during your residency, if possible, get as much subspecialty work or super, super specialty work as possible. Rot to try to rotate more in units. If you're not posted in a unit, like for example, if you are going to a, in a spine unit for six months, but you know that you may like sports uh, guys. So what you can do is you can ask a favor and you can say that, sir, can I come and scrub in with you in some a different unit? It may take some extra effort, but you know, uh, if you want to make a choice about subspecialty, I think you should have an experience. So try to get a variety of experience as much as possible in residency by hook or by crook. Uh, if not in residency, even after residency, you can try working with guys in different, like go into, go into arthroplasty, scrub in at least 10 to 15 cases, see what they do, go in sports medicine, attend the clinics, attend the OPD and also in spine. So, you know, that will, without experience, don't decide on someone else's experience. Uh, the third thing I would want to uh, stress upon when it comes to choosing a subspecialty is uh, choose choose your boss or choose your mentor very wisely because your mentors give you help you out in two ways. First is they would give you more opportunities for the future in the subspecialty. If you want to do sports medicine, you should follow a mentor who is or you should be close connection with mentor who is uh, a sports medicine person who is connected very well internationally. So they will help you in opportunities of your fellowship. Number two, they'll help you increase your network. So in nutshell of uh, choosing subspecialty, three things, choose what you love. Uh, second is follow a good boss, a good mentor of your subspecialty and get maximum experience in your residency in different sub super specialties so that you can make that final decision. Yeah, uh, over to you, Nikhil. Yeah, I think uh, Prashant has summed it up uh, quite nicely. Uh, well, I can only answer for myself. Uh, so why I do shoulders and knees is because uh, out of the four years that I trained in India, almost three and a half were spent doing uh, either knees or uh, shoulders in terms of working with bosses. Right. My spine experience was quite uh, limited during my training days. And uh, I'm sure uh, being trained in KM and uh, because uh, Wadia Hospital is just across the road and Tata is just across the road, our experience in uh, tumor surgery, bone tumor surgery, as well as pediatric orthopedics is uh, also uh, quite uh, limited. True. Now, uh, I mean, th that essentially, those are the uh, two things which I found uh, uh, really interesting. Uh, whilst I was uh, doing my fellowship at uh, the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in Stanmore, so uh, our unit was a joint reconstruction unit and we had collaboration with the bone tumor unit because a lot of bone tumor work is uh, use of mega prosthesis and uh, to be honest that uh, is another thing which I found uh, uh, quite interesting uh, uh, by then I was quite committed uh, to doing shoulders and uh, knees but as uh, Prashant rightly said that uh, before deciding uh, on any particular branch uh, 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 as subspecialty it is uh, important to at least have a flavor of uh, all the uh, available options sometimes that is not uh, feasible but uh, as much as you can within the limited time you have uh, try to work with different people try to see uh, uh, different things try to explore different horizons uh, and uh, then uh, decide upon uh, a subspecialty and you know someone might decide at the end of it that i don't want to do subspecialty work i uh, want to do 
uh, work as a trauma surgeon or as a, a journalist. And even that is fine. Uh, as long as you enjoy doing what you do, because this is something you have to do for the rest of your life. Uh, so, uh, again, you don't even have to make that decision early on. Just enjoy doing uh, what you do and enjoy your work. Uh, and there will be, there will come a time where you feel that oh, I like this particular uh, field a little bit more, and uh, I would like to spend more time uh, doing it, learning it, uh, and subspecialization requires uh, time. So uh, be ready to spend, uh, you know, uh, uh, a good few years uh, in whatever subspecialization you choose. Thanks. Thanks for the very uh, valuable comments. We do have a question in the chat box. I'll, so uh, I'll, I'll let the let the attendee complete the question. I believe it's uh, one of my colleagues from KM, Dr. Shashwat. So I'll housekeeping announcement. Feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat box. I'm keeping an eye out on them and I'll direct them to the relevant panelists uh, as and when required. So Shashwat asks, uh, he had three professors in his institute handling hip, knee, spine and pediatric ortho separately and there wasn't any rotation per se. So his experience in spine, hip, knees is fairly limited and the question is, should I go for extended training in these fields and sports medicine? Shall I take that sure. question, Prashant? Is that all right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead. So, uh, now, so if you look at orthopedic training in India, so we've had a three-year course for about 50 years now. So, since the time MS orthopedic surgery started, the course has been three years. And if you see the amount of advances which have happened in the field of orthopedics uh, and compare it to how uh, things were about 50 years back, then the amount of knowledge, the amount of surgical work has increased tremendously. So it is just not possible to learn or even to get exposed to everything within the two or three years uh, uh, of uh, within the two or three years of your training program. Uh, one uh, valuable uh, suggestion I would like to share with everyone, which uh, uh, one of my mentors uh, in Cooper Hospital when I was doing my bond there, had told me that don't uh, uh, enter into uh, practice before the age of uh, 32. Now, that's an arbitrary number, but I feel that's a, uh, uh, a good benchmark for everyone. So about five years after your uh, official uh, 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 structure training is over, spend time, visit places, see good surgeons operate, operate under supervision, uh, 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 you know, of uh, different surgeons, and then uh, go into practice. So as far as this question is concerned regarding choosing what specialty uh, to subspecialize in, I would advise that uh, it is better to maybe spend a year, uh, you know, just rotating through these other specialties which you have not yet been exposed to as much. You might find that uh, you don't like a particular thing uh, uh, or you don't want to do a, a particular uh, branch as your uh, life as a lifetime commitment so spend time uh, you're still young if you've just finished your training you've got time at hand so spend time going through all those specialties working with people uh, of those specialties if if you feel that so from from what i understand in your, from your question your major exposure has been to pediatric orthopedics if you like it a lot and if you want to commit to it then uh, i mean that's a decision made for you uh, so it, it's completely up to you. You should be at uh, peace with whatever decisions you make. As Prashant rightly said, that it is like choosing a wife. You've got to live with it or her uh, 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 for the rest of your life. Uh, and uh, I mean, you don't have to, you know, uh, marry the first girl you like. But at the same time, if you like her uh, a lot, go for it. So that, that's yeah, um... which you have to make yourself. I absolutely agree, and you know what? The, I would like to. Uh, I mean, to answer this question, I think his answer was he is he is getting exposure only in one specialty, and he is wondering if he needs an extended training uh, to experience other. The answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes. It's like you're young, and you know, while you have time, what I would do is I would just go to the other professors, and I would request them, sir, is it okay if I come and you know, like I hang around if you're doing the surgery, or if I you know if you're in the clinic. 
I'll tell you, 99% of time they would say yes, right? I mean, no one has a problem with uh, a juniors hanging out or they learning. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you take permission from your professor so that it avoids any kind of uh, ego issues. You say that, sir, I just want to have an experience. I'll go. They, he will not have a problem, and the person who's in, uh, who you'll be going to will be very happy to have you. So try to try not to get an extended fellowship, but during your residency, if you can go as much and see uh, other cases, I think that would uh, uh, that would help you a lot in your decisions. Sure. Thanks for the uh, comments. I have a closing comment to make on this question. Essentially, we do have the undergrad and postgrad bond, which is like a burden, but if you utilize it correctly, it can be an opportunity. Your bond placement is directly based on your. MS marks, score good in your exams, <clears throat> choose a bond in a unit that you like, and it's not a burden anymore. So I, I think that's a valuable year which can be utilized doing subspecialty training and a rotation in a unit or subspecialty of your choice. I think uh, Dr. Prashant, you did yours yes. in MMD unit, which was your area of work. And I continued working with Dr. Sivasta because I was keen on spine. The, yeah. I, I just to add one comment because you made yeah. you made a very good point. I think that's uh, something should be stressed upon is that during your bond period, I see a lot of people who are saying that they want a lighter posting, so they probably go in a uh, somewhere in a peripheral hospital. Uh, just my personal experience, uh, uh, this thing is that if you want to go ahead and uh, do like a fellowship just right out uh, after your bond, it is a good choice to be in a uh, in in like a central institute or I would say where there is more specialty work because you get exposed to number one very good surgeons who are internationally connected, which we may miss out if you go in periphery. Uh, second thing is your networking becomes improves a lot, and also third thing is that if you're if you're in Mumbai or you're in Delhi or you're in big big cities. You get to attend a lot of conferences, like specialty conferences, yeah, like sports sure. medicine conference, spine conferences, which may or may not happen in peripheral cities. So uh, uh, your bond here is extremely important uh, in terms of your professional growth. Uh, what would you do after uh, after your uh, education? So use that as Nandan said correctly. But try if you're if you're going for specialty work, uh, if you want to do a fellowship. Try to get your bond in a metro city where you would get exposure to number one good. Uh, network uh, with good uh, super specialty surgeons, uh, and second thing is uh, exposure of uh, attending a lot of conferences. Yeah, thanks. We we have two comments uh, questions that have come in, which essentially was my second question too. Uh, the first one uh, is for Dr. Nikhil. Given that you did your training in UK and in arthroplasty, what were the additional exams that you gave for the same, and what was your prep? like for for the uh, uk training and we have one more question for dr prashant given the fact that you were in us at johns hopkins did you have to give any additional exams either for us or korea if yes what were they and when did you give them uh, so uh, in the uk in order to do clinical work you need registration with the general medical council that's gmc now, there are uh, a few ways of getting GMC registration. One is you write the PLAB, which is a professional linguistic ability test, uh, uh, and that gives you registration. Or you can take an exam, which is recognized by one of the four Royal Colleges of UK. Uh, uh, and then once you clear that exam and to become a member of one of the Royal Colleges, you can get uh, professional registration there. Unless you have registration in UK, you cannot do any operative work, you cannot uh, clinically examine patients. So uh, first thing uh, is registration, you need to uh, pass an English exam as well. Uh, now if uh, one needs to prepare a lot for the uh, membership exam for the Royal College, I think the answer is no, it is a, an exam in a general surgery with a part of orthopedics. Uh, there is a first part which is essentially an MCQ exam, uh, which is quite straightforward to be honest, and the second part uh, is an OSCE, which again with uh, some amount of preparation is not really an obstacle. Now getting a fellowship directly in UK is difficult because uh, our degrees and our uh, training is not recognized in, as a training program in UK. So uh, at least for me, I had to spend uh, uh, about two and a half years uh, 
working as a resistor first in hip, knee, and shoulder units, uh, and then uh, based on uh, uh, my research there, my connections there, uh, references from my bosses there, I could do my three fellowships. Right. The good thing about training in UK is that uh, even when you are not actually doing a so-called structured fellowship, even when you are a registrar uh, or a senior registrar, you are doing a lot of uh, uh, clinical work. So uh, your hands are working. Uh, by the end of my two years of two and a half years of uh, uh, senior registrar post, I was fairly comfortable doing primary hips and knees, uh, doing ACLs, rotator cuff tears, and uh, that. I feel gave me an edge to get more out of my structured fellowships uh, because uh, if you go into a fellowship not being able to do a primary knee, then the six months or one year which you spend there will essentially go in learning how to do a primary knee and then the, the complex stuff uh, uh, gets sort of uh, pushed down the way. So I feel that going for a fellowship is something which needs to be done at the right time. Uh, otherwise, uh, you'll end up spending most of the time just retracting. Your your uh, consultant colleagues or your bosses are not going to let you do independent work if you can't do uh, a certain degree of independent work. Uh, so that is about uh, the, the fellowships in uh, UK at least. So yes, you need to be registered to do clinical work. You need to uh, give one of the two exams, uh, ideally the MRCS because uh, it is more relevant to surgical specialties and even after going there uh, you need to keep working hard to you know make that jump from uh, being a, a senior registrar or registrar to a uh, fellow it takes time but the time which you spend uh, is quite fruitful because uh, you are learning uh, uh, learning doesn't really have to be you know called a fellowship uh, it can happen uh, as long as you have a uh, sound mentor so as Prashant rightly said before, it's important to find mentors. Uh, but yes, that is how uh, uh, one can go about uh, applying for fellowships in UK. And that has been quick, my experience. Quick question, Dr. Nikhil. Uh, there is something called the Medical Training Initiative, the MTI, yes. where you get into a long-term structured fellowship in the UK without actually going through the MRCS process. Correct. I know from the spine perspective that it's available maybe at Nottingham. But uh, can, can you uh, briefly touch upon uh, the MTI and how do what, what does that mean? So uh, MTI, as you correctly said, is Medical Training uh, Initiative. Uh, it is a, uh, a program which is run by the Royal Colleges and uh, it has got some affiliated institutes or uh, affiliated surgeons uh, back home in India. And it works on a principle of uh, a referral from uh, your current boss to one of the uh, centers there. And once you are accepted there, they write to the Royal College to accept you into the medical training uh, initiative program. Uh, from what I know, most of them run for two years. You spend one year as an SHO, which is, which is essentially a house officer, senior house officer, and one year as uh, either a registrar or a fellow. Uh, I personally have no experience of uh, MTI because I've not, uh, you know, been right. through the MTI. Uh, so uh, I can only provide you, uh, you know, basic uh, uh, knowledge about what it is. Uh, how fruitful it is, I cannot personally comment on. Uh, but in general, uh, uh, the in, in, in general, in UK, when you spend time working as a registrar, uh, you invariably end up doing uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, operative work uh, with your boss. So I'm sure these fellowships, uh, the MTI fellowships will also be uh, fruitful. Now that can be a good start. Uh, as I said, I personally feel that you should, you need to spend a good amount of time after your MS uh, because I feel that learning is a gradual process and one becomes mature uh, with time. Uh, so uh, those two years can act like an entry into the UK system. And then when, if you focus on a particular branch, you can always spend more time there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nikhil. Coming to you, uh, Dr. Prashant. So, uh, yeah. do you have to give any uh, entry exams as such for Korea or US? If yes, what was the procedure? So, uh, yeah, I would like to disclose that uh, in South Korea, I was uh, I was in Seoul National University and uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins. So, both these places, I did not have to give any kind of entrance exam. 
So right. those of you who does who do not want the obstacle of not giving an exam, I think uh, uh, this is this is something which is very critical. First is uh, there are three most important things if you want to get a fellowship, overseas fellowship, without uh, giving any exam. Networking, networking, networking. Right. Period. There's absolutely there's absolutely no uh, beating around the bush. You got to talk to people. You got to know your bosses. You have to talk to them. each and you have to communicate with them very well i'll tell you uh, i have got a fellowship or i'm at least got an offer in which uh, i was uh, i i went to an uh, a sports medicine conference uh, i believe it was isakos conference and uh, there was a speaker who just climbed down the the you know the the dais and i just went and shook hand with him and i told him that hey i'm uh, you know i'm one of the organizing person or i'm just someone who's interested and he just offered me his uh, his card and he said email me i emailed him the, the same night next day he offered me a fellowship though he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't a funded fellowship i had to pay myself and you know bear the expenses whatever but you know it is sometimes it is just that simple so networking is extremely important uh i did not have to give any exam uh, i did not want to take that path because i always had this in mind that i had to come back to india uh so about south korea what what happened i was uh, i started collecting uh, the emails of people as i said networking you got to start somewhere if you are at a place where your bosses are not very well connected over with overseas people like you don't have a recommendation directly what i would recommend is do two things first is make a good cv your cv and your the way you write your emails represents you people do not know you personally but when you apply for a fellowship when you send that email if you if there is grammatical mistake in your email or if your cv is not formatted according to internationally accepted standards they're going to think okay this guy is like uh, you know i don't know him personally he does not have good recommendations plus i don't think he's he's done such a good job with the cv so he will not really take you seriously so be very particular about your C, your cv your letter of recommendations format them very well format your emails very well now what you got to do to get a fellowship without an exam is to send out a lot of emails right what i did was i talked to all my mentors in kem those who were connected uh, uh connected with overseas uh, uh doctors uh i had uh i i remember one night i sent out one night i sent out 56 emails uh, because i had list i gathered all this list and i sent out 56 i was like this is it this is it i sat with my beer and i sent out 56 emails i slept i forgot about it right i next i get up next day i got 12 emails back right. and they were replies they were saying they were saying that we are interested So I was really surprised. I thought that no one even checks emails, right? In India, we just think uh, because that was my experience. I never check my emails, right? We are like that, that is only for Amazon people who's bothering you, or someone's asking for your money, or someone's trying to sell you something, uh, you know. So, uh, but these people actually do check their emails. So uh, I got twelve replies. Out of them, two were funded fellowships. Like they were, they were, they were, they were going to give me a salary. There was one person who was going to give me a salary. Also, they were going to sponsor my living and my food. So you know, it is about it is about you throw everything at the wall, you throw everything you have got got the wall and see what sticks, right? And you know it 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 uh, it works very well. So number one is networking. First of all, your local mentors where you are working, try to search out people who are in your super specialty. They are doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, try to get as many emails as possible from their uh, uh, friends who are in some other country who run a fellowship program. If you don't have that, if you don't have that, then you go to PubMed. you go to pubmed if you are into shoulder i would just type shoulder research you see what are the latest research which is published you will get the corresponding author of each and every uh, uh, article you are interested in you you think you want to do like a, a shoulder sports uh, uh, fellowship or a shoulder arthroplasty fellowship see see check out the person who is publishing the most that is the person who is going to have a lot of resources it means that he is the one who is going to have a very good probably going to have a very good uh, funding at his institute and then he's you know it's it's likely that if you apply to this person yeah he's going to give you probably like a funded position which will be your salary so use pubmed there will be in corresponding author list there will be emails of all these guys so try to if if you are not getting all these contacts from your local mentor try to reach out either to pubmed either to guys like us like you know me nikhil and uh, uh and nandan who are outside people who are attending they have an easier option i've shared the instagram handles just reach out to you guys if they <laughs> <laughs> yeah so reach out to reach out to us because you know most of the times you will feel that you know what is going to say i mean what is the worst is going to happen you're not going to reply like the other person is not going to reply but you know you you try again and you be be consistent be persistent i mean you know and uh, you know you will get you will get reply so throw everything uh, you have at the wall and see what sticks 
uh, contact your local mentor in your super specialty. Number two is reach out to people through PubMed, get their emails and send out their emails that, hey, sir, I'm, I'm interested in this particular fellowship. I have this experience. This is my CV. This is my LOR and see if it's fixed. Number three, if you go to any uh, any uh, conferences, that is how I got uh, uh, one of my fellowships uh, in South Korea, is that you go and you reach out to them and you ask them that, hey, do you have a fellowship program? Do you, uh, is it funded? And you know, when is going to be open? And this is one thing about reaching out to people, networking. Second important thing is do it fast. If you want to do a fellowship, start in your second year. Don't wait until the end of your bond period or your end of the residency that you right. get something in one or two months. It's mm -hmm. very, you know, for if you don't, if you're not planning to give an exam, uh, like US Assembly or PLAB or uh, uh, AMC, Australian Medical Council, then you got to start early and develop your network. So because all this funded, I'm talking about funded fellowship, you want to go for, uh, go for, you want to pay and go somewhere and see the surgeries, that is probably going to be a little easier. But if you want them to pay you, in that case, uh, the waiting period is at least two to three years at any good institute, at least two to three years. At Johns Hopkins right now, it's three years. I know for the Korea fellowship I went, it is three years. And what happens is I, uh, you know, because this guy knows me, I, if I recommend someone, he's, there's a very likely chance that the person I'm recommending is going to get the fellowship. Right. So uh, we think that all these developed countries run in a, uh, you know, run in a very systematic, they do run in a very systematic manner, but your network is, is everything. So uh, if you want to get a fellowship without any exam, uh, please do networking, please talk to people, send out emails to random people. We have social media, reach out to people. If you think there's a surgeon, which is very good sitting in the U S just send him out your CV and see how it goes. And someone, something will uh, come your way. Uh, final thing I would like to say is that uh, in my for Johns Hopkins, I did not have to do uh, USMLE because mine was a research fellowship. It was not a clinical fellowship. I was not allowed to scrub in. Right. And no, I was, if, I did if, not know. If somebody is keen on a clinical fellowship, and obviously you would have people who were doing clinical fellowships, if it's an international graduate or somebody from India, what would be the path for him? Would it be Emily? Does he have to repeat residency? Do you have any uh, pearls on that? So there are two ways in which you can get like a clinical fellowship in the United States. <clears throat> uh, first is that you do your USMLE and uh, then you have to do your, uh, if you want to go in, how can I say the broad way where the main league of people where uh, you can, you want to get any job after your fellowship, like you're looking for a big term settling down there. Then I would recommend after USMLE get an author residency right. because then you'll be board certified. Like for example, what we have is MUHS certification. So you will be board certified in the US. You will not be someone who is who had his degree outside. You will be an American graduate and you are likely to get more jobs in better places. Like, for example, if I'm from India and I'm a, I'm a color I'm, and, uh, you know, I don't want to live in somewhere in deserts of Utah, where there's a lot of uh, probably discriminatory crowd or something, then, you know, the chances that I will get there will be more if I do only fellowship in US. Right. So if you want to work in New York, if you want to work in a more multicultural society where there's more competition, so you 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 have to do your residency there. Right. So for that way, you have to uh, do your USMLE and apply for uh, residency. It's very difficult to get, but if you struggle one or two years in the US, like as soon as you're done with your uh, residency in India, you should be uh, you should have done your step two as well. Right. So start your steps early. Start your steps in second year. And by third year, you'd be, you, you should probably be done by your step two. Then you can apply for residencies or you can apply for a research fellowship. So you have to do two to three years of research fellowship, observership in US in the same, same uh, super specialty. And maybe, excuse me, maybe after that, you can apply for a clinical fellowship. It's a little difficult to get, but trust me, I know at least five people, I know them personally that they've got it, who have done a residency in India and right now are working as, an, uh, as a consultant in US. It is possible. You got to start early. You got to be patient. Even after your residency, it could take somewhere, somewhere in between three to four years for you to get a fellowship there. Right. So clinical fellowship. So you have to be ready for that. It needs patience. You will be paid until then. But then with the visa issues, everything will be a little, uh, you know, skeptical and this thing. So if you be patient, you will definitely get it. There's, there's no way you cannot get it. Uh, second thing I would say is, uh, if you're not doing a residency, you just want to do, you want to go to US, just do a clinical fellowship and come back, uh, do USMLE and start applying, start applying to all the programs. And uh, you may not get the best of the biggest, uh, best of the places, but you'll get some of the other uh, clinical fellowship, but that needs USMLE.
Right. Uh, coming back to you, Dr. Prashant, because you went the other way where you did not give a licensing exam. One of the uh, guys listening to us, Dr. RK, he's my junior from KM. He asks, which are the countries which accept Indian graduates without any licensing exams for fellowships? Could you just list them out for us? Ready? Uh, I know three for sure. I know three for sure is uh, South Korea where I went. Right. Uh, it definitely takes them. They are very interested in taking Indian uh, doctors because they get yeah, uh, assistance and, and there. Scrubbed in. It was a clinical fellowship, right? It was a clinical fellowship. I was just scrubbed in, in uh, uh, both the places. I did my knee and shoulder fellowship in Seoul National University and TK Orthopedic Surgery. Both are really good institutes. Yeah. Uh, really good experience. They would. Uh, they speak English and uh, the country is beautiful and you'll have amazing time. I would like to say that my initial plan was to go for three years, but I liked the training so much that I uh, ended up extending for another year uh, and a half. So uh, you'll have an amazing experience. Uh, yeah. Any other countries where, you know, so South Korea, South Korea is definitely number one. Number two would be uh, Australia. I also got an uh, Australian fellowship based on uh, there is an amazing website uh, of uh, Australian orthopedic surgeons or uh, Australian orthopedic association. Yeah, if you type that on the Google, there'll be an orthopedic fellowship. You would see this is like gold mine, right? You go to that website, there's 70 email addresses of people who are waiting to give you fellowship. Just go with your CV, keep your CV ready, make sure that your email is pitch perfect, it is formatted very well, there's no grammatical mistakes. Just apply to them. Apply to 70 fellowships in whatever category you want. You apply to them and you'll probably hear back from one or two of them. They will have, there'll be disappointments. Uh, they will say that uh, this thing is full, you don't have enough clinical experience, you don't have enough. Uh, research in your bag to kind of get that fellowship, but it's worth a try. So Australia, Australia, South Korea, I know for sure people go in Japan, you can definitely go. Uh, uh, I would say uh, Thailand. You know, Canada, I did not have to give any licensing exam as such. Uh, essentially, the process is the only exam you might have to give is the IELTS or something for English language. In my case, uh, they waved it off after the interview because they felt that this guy seems okay. So no exam as such for Canada, you get a local license, which uh, is valid only to that particular hospital and the city. So essentially I can do a clinical practice only in that division, in that hospital cannot shift to a different city. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's valid only for the period of the fellowship. So if somebody is planning to come to Canada just for a clinical fellowship, no exams required, work on your CV, do some research. But if you're keen on staying here, as a long-term uh, goal or an end point, again, the plan would be come here, repeat residency and, uh, you know, you get board certified and settled. But if you're keen just on a clinical fellowship, the North American surgical experience, I decided that Canada would be a better option because I wasn't too keen on going through the steps of Emily and the whole procedure. So uh, that's one more country there. If you have a decent CV and you work on a particular uh, university, you can essentially get in. What helped uh, was obviously the KM background because we had many seniors from KM, including Arvind Kulkarni sir from Bombay Hospital, who was a fellow here previously, and at least four to five people from India who were fellows in the last decade. So that that helped me a lot. We have as far we, as the. Uh... Yeah, sorry. fellowship application process in UK is concerned. Right. So there is a website, uh, NHS Jobs, mm -hmm. and all uh, fellowships in UK, they uh, have to be mandatorily uh, advertised on this website. So if you just look up uh, on this website, you'll see adverts of uh, uh, fellowships in UK. Generally, uh, they start in uh, Feb and August, so one year or six months. So because that's how they the the, the trainees or residents there rotate. So it's a competitive process. You apply through NHS jobs, there is shortlisting. Um, uh, you are then called for an interview with other uh, uh, applicants and, uh, and then there's a formal interview process. And if they find you uh, uh, appropriate, they appoint you. Now, as Prashant said uh, about, uh, uh, you know, applying a couple of years in advance to uh, eventually get a fellowship. So uh, I fellowship interview for my shoulder fellowship was somewhere in October 2018 and, and uh, I'd applied for uh, the fellowship starting in Feb 2019. 
uh, but there was someone else uh, uh, who did better than me in that interview. They liked me as well, and they said uh, that we can't offer you the fellowship starting uh, in three months, but we like you, and uh, uh, if it is okay with you, we'll give you the fellowship starting the following year. So, as Prashant rightly said, that these fellowships are uh, booked in advance uh, because uh, for them it's more convenient you know if they know that there's someone coming uh, uh, in advance uh, you don't have to keep advertising things there's a whole process of uh, uh, employing someone uh, perhaps uh, sponsoring the work visa so uh, uh, they like to do things in advance and uh, uh, which is why these fellowship spots are filled up uh, a couple of years in advance right Dr. Siddhi asks, oh. what's the procedure for Germany? Uh, none of us have been to Germany, but from what I understand, uh, you just require to be proficient in German language in order to work there and no licensing exam required per se if you have the required numbers of experience. Dr. Prashant, you had to so, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About Germany, I mean, I read that uh, question and uh, I happen to have uh, one of the good things about uh, doing fellowships is that you meet people from all over the world. Right. who share their experiences, right? So I, I, I know this guy who's a very good friend of mine. I did a fellowship with him in South Korea. But before coming to South Korea, he actually did like a traveling, it's kind of like a traveling fellowship uh, in uh, uh, in Europe. So what he did was he did like a couple of months in Germany, he did a couple of months in Italy. And then uh, I think, I believe he went to Spain. So what, what he would do is he, he just landed, uh, he started sending out emails of people he met in uh, conferences. And whoever said that, hey, you come to me for one or two, one or, one or two months. So they did not, uh, 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 they did not need uh, a local language kind of, you know, uh, proficiency or something, uh, or uh, uh, did not want had to know Italian or German language. English would do, uh, but the only thing is, and he was also getting paid. What he would do is he would work for five days, and two days he would roam around uh, Europe. And he got in touch. One guy referred him to another guy, and another guy referred him to another guy, and that is how he did like six months fellowship. Uh, he was he was getting scrubbed in there as well. So that is again the perk. The most important thing is networking. Uh, uh, that is what I would like to say. That other fellowships are also available in Europe. If someone wants Germany, you just need to know the right guys, and you got to send out the emails when you meet these people in uh, uh, in conferences. Right. Coming to the next question. Uh, Prashant, uh, can you switch back to your uh, previous position? Essentially, you're now yeah. Sorry, yep, sorry. thanks. No problem. Sorry. So the next section is uh, what differently did you do in your residency to land these fellowships? Apart from the networking that you spoke about, the role for research and uh, Dr. Vijay asks, is there any role for doing a DNB post MS? Does that contribute towards landing a good fellowship? Your takes on that. Uh, so as far as uh, doing a uh, sorry, so, so as far as doing a DNB uh, post MS is concerned, I have not personally uh, done it because uh, I really did not uh, see any value addition uh, 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 in terms of my career progression. Uh, I wrote the MRCS in the time I had after my MS, and uh, uh, that is. What was that was what was more useful to me uh, in my uh, career progression. So I personally, uh, and I may be wrong here, but that is again my personal opinion. I did not uh, see any uh, value in giving the DNB exam after uh, doing my MS. As to what you can do uh, during your MS is uh, if you are able to figure out what niche specialty you like, then I think that is half the battle won because then you get, get a clear direction. Uh, try to present as much as possible. Uh, it helps in two ways. One, uh, people notice you when you uh, speak and uh, you yourself uh, 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 become uh, more confident uh, uh, while uh, talking to international faculty. Uh, get a good trauma experience, at least from the point of view of UK fellowships. I feel that uh, you should be able to do trauma very well because even while uh, uh, doing uh, a shoulder or a knee fellowship, there used to be an occasional uh, uh, trauma on call, and uh, your initially your your surgical skills. People are watching you, so your surgical skills are uh, gauged on how you can handle a theater, how you can uh, do straightforward trauma cases. Uh, when they when people realize that uh, you are a good surgeon, that is when you uh, start operating uh, uh, elective work under supervision, and uh, eventually 
uh, by the end of the fellowship, you are doing uh, independent lists with no supervision. So that's how uh, uh, things progress, at least in the UK. So uh, if you're planning on going to UK, I think you've got to be, uh, 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 you know, well versed in doing basic uh, trauma work. You should have uh, at least a conversant knowledge of uh, whatever specialty uh, you are uh, choosing. So if somebody says, uh, uh, you know, if they, if they mention a particular article or they, if they mention a particular index, it shouldn't be that uh, you are completely unaware uh, of uh, that particular phrase. So you should have uh, read enough about whichever specialty you are committing to, uh, to at least sound knowledgeable. Uh, see, because there are two things uh, uh, which I feel uh, uh, make a good surgeon. One is uh, uh, your actual surgical skill, which is uh, imperative. But the other thing is understanding and decision making. So most of uh, uh, your uh, judgment is going to be in clinics, uh, in, uh, in your behavior with patients, how you reach a particular diagnosis and how you discuss a particular treatment plan. And once you're able to get to that barrier and on the sa at the same time, uh, 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 you know, uh, convince your bosses that you're a safe surgeon, you're a competent surgeon, and you're a reasonably quick surgeon, okay. then that is when you start doing uh, uh, a good uh, amount of operative work. See, eventually, any fellowship you do, when you come out of it, you should feel uh, like a fully baked surgeon. Uh, you shouldn't, you know, feel like I sh this is a particular uh, lacune in my uh, surgical ability or knowledge. So, uh, uh, spend time and uh, try to figure out what you want and then approach it in a, a holistic way uh, to get the uh, best out of uh, your fellowships. Right. So essentially, in a summary, uh, no role for DNB post-MS, rather focus your energy on the MRCS because that, yeah, that is what have I a more say. value addition from the fellowship perspective. Okay. Uh, Dr. Prashant, there is a question for you. Could you please share the Australian website in the chat box while I go to the next one? <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just like to show here is this is the AA, uh, AAO orthopedics. I just put like uh, Australian Ortho Fellowship uh, in my uh, Google or whatever it is, right? So this is what shows up. Uh, if you go on this particular website, AAO website, if you see this accredited fellowship directory, right? Right. If you go to this option, oh crap, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you go in this option, there's sub subspecialty and there's everything here. Like what do you want, like whatever you need. I'm not sure if you can, if it's focusing very well, but it's like uh, arthroplasty, arthroscopy, foot and ankle spine. And this is like Perth Fellowship. And these are, these are all the fellowships which are available. So this is like a huge list of fellowship based on whatever. So uh, just type on your in your Google uh, Australian Orthopedic Asso uh, Association fellowships, and you would see this list of fellowship in accredited fellowship directory. Thanks. So, so that was really useful. Uh, the next burning question, which many of the panelists have asked in the chat box, and which I wanted to ask as well, uh, was the role of funding. I obviously know from uh, your experience, Dr. Prashant, that the Korean one was self-funded. What was the status for your research fellowship in Johns Hopkins? And again, Dr. Nikhil, uh, did you receive any funding for your training? How was it? Was it sustainable for an Indian graduate? Um, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, I lost You're you for a second. For yeah, I, I'm sorry, I lost the question. I, I, the question is about funding. Was your fellowship sorry. either in Korea or in US funded? and how sustainable was it? And the same question for Dr. Cool. Nikhil, because many of the people who are listening to us, they have this question, because that's an important thing as well, because as an Indian trainee, you're earning in Indian rupees, and then suddenly you're going to a country abroad, which may not be possible for everyone when you're spending in say dollars or pounds. So yeah. how, what what was the funding like, and was it sustainable yes. for so a in, routine Indian yes. graduate? Correct, so in UK, uh, these uh, uh, registrar posts or registrar jobs as they uh, or a fellow job as they call it they are all uh, paid uh, uh, you are paid as much as a uh, british trainee or a british uh, fellow is paid for that particular job so it is fully paid uh, it's quite uh, comfortable you can rent a house you can buy a car uh, so i i essentially uh, went there uh, because i was already married married in india 
and right. uh, my wife is an ophthalmologist so even for her uh, getting fellowships there uh, as opposed to uh, us was a little bit more straightforward uh, so between the two of us it was quite all right you also end up uh, uh, saving uh, you know because when, when you return you need uh, a buffer before you actually start uh, you know making some money out of whatever you want uh so putting all that uh together i feel that financially it is very sustainable uh uk uh, uh whilst you are there also uh, as prashant said uh, one of his colleagues used to you know travel uh on weekends in europe uh, europe is just across uh, the atlantic uh, so uh, you just take a, a two hour flight and you reach uh, uh, spain you take the train reach france so you know even whilst you are there uh, in life is not only about uh, you know doing clinical work or research work you get enough uh, uh, time and money to uh, travel see places and uh, you know have a good time in general so yes they are funded and uh, they pay pretty well at least in in uk even the registrar jobs uh, and the uh, fellow jobs right uh nikhil do you mind telling them how much was it because i'm going to disclose that those figures as well so that they can plan out and you know save money accordingly and stuff yeah and then if there is somebody traveling with a family or young kids or something like that would it be sustainable yes. for them as well yes so uh, uh registrar you would make somewhere around uh, 3 and 1/2000 pounds uh, every month post tax uh which is which, which is quite uh, all right to sustain in uk even with the family right in canada it's somewhere around 3500 dollars post tax which is again quite sustainable for a comfortable living yeah and i'm not traveling with family so it's way easier for me but even if somebody was they wouldn't face much of problems on that front okay yeah. uh, so about idea yeah about- Yeah, about funding, I would like to quote figures, and I would like to quote uh, figures in Indian uh, uh, in Indian rupees uh, for people to understand it in a better way. So, uh, when I went to South Korea, my first fellowship, which was for three months at Seoul National University, they typically give you about like a thousand dollars, which is seventy sixty to seventy thousand ru- Indian rupees per month. Right. Now, that is you can sustain that way uh, in South Korea in a very minimal. I would say that you know, not uh, too much of a very great life you can stay in uh, hostels or something like this where you can stay in a very small one room kitchen kind of a place uh, and uh, you can uh, you can still travel around uh, when i was in south korea i visited five to six con- surrounding countries and all of that was uh, based on whatever money i earned there so first is uh, my first fellowship was like that second fellowship i became like a senior fellow uh so the amount they paid me was 1.2 lakhs per month uh so it got a little better uh, in terms of i could travel more i could uh, have like a better lifestyle uh definitely sustainable even with family i think it's definitely sustainable but i would definitely recommend people to save up at least 2 to 3 lakh uh in their residency that's extremely essential because when you go to the new place you have no idea what's going to happen uh even getting a fellowship traveling even if they're sponsoring it initial you need initially you need that kind of a backup money uh and also when you're traveling to a new country make sure that you have at least 1000 to 2000 us dollars in your pocket because right. it doesn't matter where you go that is going to you know 1000 1000 dollars in your pocket uh is like must if you land in any kind of trouble so uh they pay you very well these these fellowships are hard to come by they are uh, uh, they are mostly distributed based on uh, how much is uh, based on uh, uh, networking So uh, again, just to stress on networking, that if you're on paid fellowship, you have to know your mentors. You have to uh, network with people. Second thing is, uh, when I went to the US, uh, so uh, this was also a completely funded program. So they paid me somewhere around like fifty thousand uh, dollars per year. Uh, it keeps changing, but my program was like that. So it is about, uh, I believe, somewhere around twenty-five lakhs. Uh, uh, sorry, I take it back. It was something about two point five lakhs per month. Right. So in my fellowship in South Korea, they were paying me 1.2 lakhs in uh, in US for a research fellowship, not clinical work at all, only research fellowship. And the clinical fellows also have the same uh, pay structure. Uh, the the yeah the this thing was 2.5 lakhs, and uh, I would I would I would say that 50% of your salary would go in a decent living and uh, your lifestyle uh, maintenance. Uh, if you're going with the family, probably you'll end up uh, spending 60% of your salary. 
like 1.5 lakhs or something per month in the US. Uh, but rest you can save and definitely you can travel. So, but, but the take home message is you break even and you don't essentially uh, require to ask for funds from home or get an education loan. But that's that's what the take home message I think was from the whole discussion that if you get into a funded program, you should be able to break even, no requirement for some loans or something like that. And um, yeah, there was one more question from Dr. Shashwat about. Uh, how much was the expenditure for clearing the MRCS? I can take that question and then if I miss out on something, Dr. Nikhil, you can elaborate. I I thought that the step one itself uh, costed around 50,000 in terms of Indian rupees to uh, as an exam fee. The step two costed around a lakh or 90,000 rupees as the exam yes, fee. Around that, correct. Uh, so that's uh, around 1.5 lakh uh, as an exam fee. And uh, with regards to the material that we do for the prep, I utilized a bit of uh, pass test and EMRCS, which itself cost around 30,000. And many a times the uh, exam center for the part two is not your home city. So you add yeah. or subtract the traveling costs. So essentially, you can round it up to around two lakh. Two, two to 2.5 lakh, not yeah. more than that. Yes. Are those yeah. numbers correct? Yes. And I think that is a uh, good investment. Uh, because as I said, whilst you are working there, you are uh, earning and learning together. So, uh, I mean, uh, I think it is a very good uh, investment. Okay. Hey. Thanks. Thanks for the I'm sorry, I lost you guys. No problem. We, we were just covering about some exam costs for MRCS. That was one of the questions asked and what is the exact number in terms of figures. So, yeah. Coming to the uh, next question, uh, let me go through the list. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Nandan, before you move on, I think someone asked about research in yeah. the residency and it's extremely essential. If you want to get an overseas fellowship, uh, you got to show up for yourself in terms of your CV. Yeah, the, the way they're going to measure you is your uh, research experience. But before uh, it is, it does. Uh, can you share the link for your article on the hurdles for an uh, Indian or an Asian graduate to get into the North American program, which was published in a very prestigious journal recently? Could you share that in the chat box so people can just download the PDF version of it? Yeah, absolutely. I'll do it. I'll do it in some uh, just like two minutes or something like this. Sure, uh, so about research, about research, absolutely. I think that you know you got to get you got to enter your research as long as you are in an academic institute. Do not uh, you know? I think I think it's futile and waste of waste of protoplasm if you're working in an uh, uh, academic institute as a resident or otherwise and not doing research. Uh, it's extremely. It is going to help you somehow, some way or the other. Uh, in life, not just for the fellowship, but beyond. I'll tell you the three main things, which I think why all of us should do research at some or the other point. First is that for professional excellence, people are going to, you know, your peers are going to fall, you know, like uh, refer you cases based on, you know, somewhere or the other, you know, you get your name kind of, uh, I, I believe that people know you for your research that, okay, this guy has done shoulder research as well. So he probably knows something or the other. Of course, experience is going, no one, nothing can, Nothing can replace the clinical experience a person has or word of mouth. But at the same time, for young guys like us to come up uh, and, uh, you know, if we quote our own data that I have done this research, even for patients, it's a good marketing tool. So uh, at least this is being followed in the U.S. that, uh, you know, for them, uh, research is a big marketing tool. So uh, that is probably going to start in India at some point of time. But uh, it's a good marketing tool. It will help you uh, create your name or, you know, make a name in, in amongst your peers to increase your referrals. Uh, for the cases and fin finally i think it makes you somewhere or the other if you follow research uh, if you have that kind of scientifically critical mind it helps your clinical uh, practice yeah. uh, there is no driver for academics like if you're not giving any exam you don't feel the need to sit down and study but if you're writing a paper you actually go into the depth so uh, research right. not, i feel it not only helps with regards to your cv but you know you get updated and are abreast with all the current trends and knowledge because without an exam to keep us on our toes, nobody is going to spend a weekend reading up on a, you know some academic stuff unless there is a driver. So, Dr. Nikhil, your take on research, how useful was it uh, landing those uh, cool programs in UK? Yes. So, uh, 
my research profile when I trained and when I did my bond was limited. I had only a few publications. Uh, essentially, most of the research which I did was uh, in UK. I was a part of a few uh, national randomized trials, recruiting uh, patients. Um, I presented, a, uh, uh, you know, a few papers here and there. So uh, it does help, as you rightly said. I think. Uh, whether it helps in your marketability or not, I think what is most important is that uh, when you do research, it gives you time to reflect on your own practice. It helps you to critically analyze other people's work. And uh, sometimes you realize that, uh, you know, uh, a particular paper does not really uh, convey what it is supposed to convey. So the, the hidden messages uh, which uh, uh, need critical analysis, I think uh, to develop a receptive mind to critically analyze papers, it is important to have uh, gone through that uh, process of writing papers. Uh, it does help uh, while uh, getting fellowships. Uh, uh, even presenting and uh, uh, speaking on uh, 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 international forums does help. Right. Uh, and it it gives your, you know, it, it, when you are uh, speaking to a colleague, uh, if you are uh, saying things based on uh, either your own research or on research which you have uh, contributed to or read, then uh, that gives more credibility to whatever right. you are saying. So you, I feel that uh, you get taken uh, more seriously as a colleague if you right. uh, speak in terms of uh, evidence-based medicines and all the more better if that evidence is uh, something you have uh, contributed to for generating. For sure. And uh, your uh, conversation changes from in my personal experience or in my experience, you start quoting so and so author in this journal uh, said, you know, and that Correct. lends credibility to any conversation and people start hearing you. Uh, for a beginner, uh, just an orthopedic residency, I would like to add that you can start off by collecting or documenting all the interesting cases that you come across, publish uh, smaller case reports or technical notes on some surgical uh, skill that you learned and gradually advance on to I'm just adding Prashant Meshram, we lost yes. him. Yeah. So uh, it advance on to a case series or full papers. And then finally, in your fellowship year, you can focus on, say, a systematic review or a meta-analysis once uh, you reach that stage. So what I thought was uh, the rejection rate in the beginning was very high. Out of 10 articles that we sent to journals, eight or nine would get rejected. So uh, it, it's disheartening when that happens, but then you, you select one more journal, which is a slightly a lower impact one or something like that. Start off slow with case reports or case series, then go on to full papers. And then in your fellowship year, you can do a systematic review or something like that. Again, uh, in terms of research, case reports and journal articles are not the only avenue. Uh, we have one article that Dr. Prashant has shared uh, in, in, in the chat box, which is about difficulties that Indian or Asian graduates have when applying to North American programs. So research can be about various things and it can even be like a chapter in a book or something like that. All of it ultimately adds to your CV. So I, I think uh, you can branch out and really work on different uh, types of research it doesn't have yes. to be a meta-analysis to begin with okay the point of note but at the same time i would uh, request everyone to be a little careful of uh, predatory journals uh, don't publish for the sake of publishing because uh, yeah. people uh, on the other end are not fools and uh, a bad research article uh, will mark you down much more uh, uh, when you're applying, uh, you know, to uh, uh, fellowships or uh, any jobs. So uh, right. don't try to get involved in, uh, you know, uh, uh, research just for the sake of adding more and more uh, 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 publication numbers behind your yeah. name. Uh, try to do genuine research and try to publish in uh, uh, good accredited journals. That, that is something I would say because uh, I, I, I started with case reports and uh, initially the good avenue which I found for case reports. So JOCR, the Journal of Orthopedic Case Reports, it's PubMed indexed and they do like a really quick review. So you can start off with case reports or something smaller and then move on to full papers. Uh, Dr. Prashant, you were saying something when we lost your connection. Um, 
from what what our experience is uh, uh, we are a little scared about getting into research we think it's probably it's a little difficult to get uh, to get done or jiske paas time hai isse kya milega and all these are questions you got to go beyond that and you got to think about it i think it's like doing uh, nandan i i remember that uh, the first shoulder place you operated because like a proximal humerus fracture you in yeah. second year and you know no second year does it right so i i scrubbed, scrubbed in with you and you know you did it i'm very sure that you have done like tens of it right now and right now you are doing amazing at it that is how research is it's a skill set when you do it for the first time it is going to be a little painful it is going to take a little time it is going to be a little bit of disappointment as you keep doing it you get better at it for right now right now for uh, for people who are who have published two to three uh, articles they know what the process is they they do not make that those mistakes and it becomes easier with time i can tell you that for sure your acceptance rate gets in, uh, improved as a researcher you becomes uh, uh, you become like much more uh, i think efficient in terms of getting things published so uh, you have to be a little patient it's a skill set so uh, don't be disappointed if you're not getting published uh, uh, anywhere or uh, in some journals there's going to be uh, there's a learning curve attached with that so uh, be on the track it will help you get fellowships uh, research will get to help fellow get fellowships it will help you also uh, as well uh, in future in your life somewhere or the other considering the current trend, trends of social media and how educated and how very well read our patients are uh it is going to make some other difference in the future at least for people who want to do a uh, like a practice in metro cities so when you get a chance get a get a publication thanks thanks for the comment and glad you remember the case it's a very uh, fond memory yeah. show case in a second year it only happens when you send a informing reg off for rounds in the morning and then you're stuck in the emerge with a cool senior reg so yeah I think luck. Is <laughs> there. No, I think I think you made your third year disappear somehow for that. I think so that so. there's no one else but you. <laughs> Coming back to uh, the question of fellowship funding, one important point which I would like to touch upon is there are many organizations which offer funded fellowships. Uh, from the spine perspective, AO Spine has national as well as international fellowships that are funded. The Association of Spine Surgeons of India has short term as well as long term fellowships that are funded. Uh, talking about international fellowships and organizations, because uh, today's uh, Insta Live session is focused on uh, international fellowships. There is uh, there are place uh, organizations like SICOT, which uh, offer funding for various programs. So to summarize, A O Sicot, ASI in spine. We also have the Asia Pacific Spine Society (APSS), which offers funding for fellowship programs. Uh, Dr. Prashant, Dr. Nikhil, any organizations from the uh, hip, uh, knee, or shoulder perspective which offer uh, funded fellowship programs for Indian graduates? So I think ISACOS has a fellowship registry as well. Uh, uh, NHS Jobs is a good uh, resource. Yeah, uh, but uh, again, while applying for uh, fellowships, uh, these fellowships, uh, you know, which are short term. Uh, so, I mean, I would advise people to, you know, uh, uh, do these fellowships at a, perhaps a later stage in their career when they are already proficient in doing a certain level of work. Uh, that is what I personally feel. I may be wrong, but uh, uh, I mean the short term. You know, visit some uh, place to see what somebody is doing different. You've got to know what you know, uh, or you got to have your way of doing things first before uh, seeing something different. So short term fellowships, especially, uh, I think overall they are quite uh, easy to get. You apply and you tell them you're going to pay for uh, you know your stay and your uh, travel. Then why not? They'll be more than happy to just let you. Uh, come right. to theater and uh, uh, observe, uh, but then uh, you have to be uh, sure in your mind as to what you are looking to gain from a, uh, a particular uh, fellowship. So uh, 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 this, there will be a, a lot of these things online, which uh, you know you apply and you get accepted too. But uh, be careful as you know what what to uh, what you choose. Uh, we as Indian trainees, I feel we tend to undersell ourselves, and uh, you know try to grab whatever comes our way. So uh, again, um, be confident in your own training, and uh, you know try to choose things uh, rather than just uh, 
uh, take whatever uh, comes your way. I, that is what I personally feel. And right. especially the short-term traveling fellowships, I feel that that is something which one can do later on in uh, okay. life, a couple of weeks, you know, just to see uh, a few uh, uh, different uh, surgeries done uh, by somebody who is a specialist in that field. Uh, but uh, early on, I feel uh, you have got to grind and do your hard work, uh, get enough clinical research experience uh, and get enough confidence to, do, to you know, uh, make those clinical decisions and operate at a certain uh, level. And I, I always tell uh, uh, my uh, juniors or peers or whoever uh, asks me for advice that, uh, I mean, when uh, should you feel that, uh, uh, you know, now I'm done with uh, my uh, fellowship training. If your patient is your parent or your spouse or your child, and if you feel confident enough to operate on them, I feel that is uh, an indicator of you having uh, learned what you have to. And that is when I think it is time uh, to right. start your own uh, I, I agree with you when it comes to the comment on structured fellowships that you do a training period of a year two or even more and then switch on to the short term ones but just to enumerate uh, the organizations uh, which fund programs do you have any idea uh, if there is somebody who has done a structured program in India and then say wants to do a short term fellowship abroad any avenues for funding but Dr. Prashant, Dr. Nikhil, any of you. So, yeah. as I said, ISACOS uh, is again a, a good website uh, and uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, resources uh, to right. apply. And uh, I mean, if you're going for short term, as Prashant said, it is, it is best to uh, zero in on a particular uh, uh, consultant who you are uh, interested in working for. And I feel that if you mention in your email that I will sponsor my own stay and my travel, then people are more than willing to, you know, uh, offer you uh, a chance to come and, uh, you know, observe them or uh, serve up with them, depending on the rules in that particular uh, country. Right. Yeah. Uh, and just to add to the list of uh, organizations uh, is uh, what you're missing out on here is uh, the, f uh, the support from the industry. So I know for a fact that uh, there was uh, there were fellows from uh, Smith and Nephew. I, I should not name name any you know companies, but yeah, Smith no, and Nephew, and Nephew, and uh, industry support. <laughs> industry support. Let's just yeah. keep it industry support. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're gonna get some money uh, uh, than otherwise. I mean, you know, they will they will you know if if uh, this is like kind of. Uh, uh, pushing for their brands or something like this, but uh, not to land any trouble, but uh, the information should go across. Is I uh, I have I have seen people from Tepio, Indian uh, doctors who were in uh, uh, Singapore, uh, who were getting a fellowship, uh, two to three months fellowship uh, from uh, uh, Smith and Nephew for sure, Tepio for sure, Chen uh, Jedan. Then uh, I think Linva Tech uh, is another company which sponsors Indian doctors uh, to go abroad uh, into South Korea. So uh, what I would say, suggest is like if you're with your boss in India and you know, get, getting scrubbed in cases and they're used to using some kind of implants, just ask them that, okay, do you have this kind of opportunities or can you connect me with them? They typically, they're PR guys. You, what you got to do is you got to, this is also networking. Networking is not just with the doctors. It is also with the industry people. So if you go to a conference meet, uh, conference meeting and there's a lot of, there's typically like a manager of the regional manager available at the counter. You go and you ask them that I want to do this kind of fellowship. Can you connect me with the PR guy? So if your boss is very well connected, he's giving them good business, uh, that person is going to probably send you uh, for a, a clinical fellowship at least two to three months. And, you know, yeah. I would not like uh, there's like to stress upon this. If you if you are very young, if you're just out of your residency, do not go for a two month fellowship, three month fellowship. Right. Please do yourself a favor and do it at least for any year. You're not going to learn anything. Uh, once you go to other country, it takes like, I believe that it takes three months to just to get acclimatized to the culture, the work culture, the social culture. And for you to get over that whole uh, being away from the family and everything, your learning starts after three months. So I would recommend that go for a one year fellowship if early on, as Nikhil Pangon said, uh, short term fellowships are only if you're uh, if you're in your practice and you want to take just one uh, week off and uh, go to different places and uh, see, uh, then short term fellowships are useful for that. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend a very short-term fellowship early on in the career. Right. Uh, like your IO, IOA has a, a, a few sponsored yeah. fellowships. Indian Orthopedic Association. Even they have uh, quite a few long-term sponsored fellowships. Uh, because uh, when I was uh, attending a conference in UK, I met a, a couple of fellows who were sponsored by the uh, IOA. So they have got a tie-up with uh, Golden Jubilee uh, Hospital in uh, Glasgow. 
and there is one foot and ankle fellowship uh, and there is one arthroplasty fellowship uh, there which is sort of uh, uh, it's not sponsored through ioa when you get paid by the hospital but there is a a, a link there which sort of uh, uh, sends fellows uh, for doing that particular job so that is another thing uh, to be aware of thanks uh, one one more uh, organization which offers funding is uh, the tata trusts the tata trusts obviously uh, as uh, people who have done their undergrad in india would know they also fund your ug education the support continues even in post grad as well as your fellowship program the only thing that the tata trusts require is an invitation letter from the fellowship coordinator so like dr prashant mentioned you just mention in your email that you would be arranging your own funding they would accept you and send you an invitation letter all you got to do is log into the tata trust website send the invitation letter they'll send you a bunch of questions including the estimated cost the only thing that they are keen on is uh, will you be settling abroad or would you be coming back to india so if it's a short term fellowship and obviously you are coming back home they would be more than eager to sponsor you so there would be a short interview with the uh, uh, trustees from the tata board where they would ask you questions about uh, why is this fellowship important and how is it go going to benefit you in your career what do you plan to do when you come back home and contribute uh, to our country so more or less it's just a screening protocol just to make sure that you aren't running away abroad which is fair considering that they are funding you and uh, my trip to uh, korea as well as italy was funded by the tatas so it was really good because i didn't have to spend a penny obviously i'll be coming back home so that's the deal so i uh, in in terms of like uh, your as i said the structure of your email and the language is extremely important so uh, i have uh, given like a webinar on overseas fellowship it was not directed towards specifically towards orthopedic surgery it was mostly about indian doctors having uh, uh, you know going for overseas fellowship so it is available on my facebook uh, page uh, it is also available on youtube if you put my name and say overseas fellowship in that talk i have mentioned uh, what what exactly how exactly you should write an email if you're sending uh if you're requesting for a fellowship and okay. uh, many other kind of social cultural uh, you know adaptations for a for an overseas fellowship so uh, guys want to check out that one article and also that one webinar about overseas fellowship sure uh we are we are getting many questions about indian fellowships like the asce or the fnb programs and their comparison i would like to stress here again that today's uh, webinar is specifically directed to overseas fellowships and we would come back subsequently uh with somebody who has done both so that person would be in a better uh, position to compare a structured indian program versus a structured program abroad so that would be a uh, slightly digressing from today's uh, primary topic but we'll touch upon uh, the scfnb exams the uh, indian uh, structured fellowship scene and how does it compare uh, with the programs abroad but obviously that's a talk for a different session so we'll take those questions later housekeeping announcement again we've had many questions which have already been answered previously so what i'm going to do is at the end of our talk i'll put a post on instagram and if there are any questions that we could not answer today or were already answered before you guys joined in leave that as a comment in the box and i'm pretty sure that uh, uh, dr prashant and dr nikhil would be happy to answer uh, the question either as a reply to your comment or uh, in a dm if that sounds reasonable is that okay uh, sounds amazing yeah absolutely okay. okay i mean anyway anyway the the operating operation room that is in india are not running in full slate so we have you know right. happy to help right. sitting and doing nothing or you know, going through in instagram reels might as well help out some people thanks so much so i'll, I'll put on a post about uh, today's uh, talk uh, on instagram and if any of your questions were, weren't answered today or they were answered before you managed to join in leave that in the comment box and we will either reply to it in the comment or uh, dm to you separately if you are more comfortable in that space uh, coming back to the uh, last and final question for today uh, how did you do your end point planning while completing the fellowship so what what was going through your mind did you uh, reach out and prepare a stage already to, so that you can come back and dance on it or how how did it work do you want to take the question prashant 
Sure, absolutely. So, uh, in, in my third, I wanted to go to South Korea for uh, three months. I had a very small mind, like uh, go, uh, com- coming out of a residency. I did not plan for a very full fledged one year, two year fellowship. So, I was uh, only supposed to go there for three months. But as I went there, I realized that there's so much to learn. There's so much we do not know about. Uh, I was interested in sports medicine. So much you do not know. As you learn, uh, uh, as, as you learn, uh, that gives you kind of a window to learn more. So uh, I was offered a one and a half years extension in South Korea. They paid me the double amount. Uh, they gave me a senior position. Uh, and uh, uh, I was coming in as a first assistant in all the cases. And uh, my next fellowship was in Australia after one and a half years. The point I want to stress is that be open minded. There's, you know, I would I would like to say that, you know, there's nothing called as an end point. It is always uh, if, you, if you're going to an overseas fellowship, don't say that, OK, you're going to come back and start uh, your practice. I mean, that keeps that an option, but also new opportunities open up. So watch out for new opportunities because when you go there, there's a lot more. If you're already there, you are in the system, then a lot more new opportunities open up. There are better fellowships with better funding, with, uh, with, with better learning opportunities. So number one is watch out. Even when you go for a fellowship there, watch out for more opportunities there uh, if, you, if you're interested in. Uh, uh, so when I was finishing my uh, fellowship in South Korea, I thought I would go to Australia uh, for a clinical fellowship in sports medicine. But then at the same time, my, my boss in South Korea uh, was an ex-fellow from Johns Hopkins uh, who recommended me for that research program. So uh, it, uh, I, I, I never applied for Johns Hopkins. It was recommended to me. My boss recommended my name for that fellowship because they became good friends. They were good friends since this because he did his fellowship there. So that the mentoring in US and South Korea, they were good. They were like very tight together. So uh, he recommended me and it just came together. If, if I thought that, okay, uh, I can either go for a clinical fellowship in Australia or a research fellowship where I will not get scrubbed in for one year in Johns Hopkins. So that was like a judgment call for me. So uh, what I'm saying is that keep your mind open. New opportunities come up. You will just get lucky and land up a you know, a good opportunity and think about what you want to do in the future. You think about that. Okay. Your, your career is, you're probably uh, being a, being a surgeon, you're going to operate until like 70, 60 or 70. So what are you going to do in, uh, you have for 30 to 40 years to cover up in terms of, uh, in terms of clinical practice and in terms of, uh, you know, that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. But whatever you do in your training period for one or two years, that is going to have a huge impact on the rest of your career. So don't be in a hurry to come back. Keep your mind open. If you're getting new opportunities, jump on them. Think about them. Talk to your family. Uh, if uh, everything goes well, uh, go for them. So number one, there's no end point. I right. think there are new opportunities and you should jump on them. That's what Nandan did as well, right? Uh, uh, you also had some opportunities there and then you to Canada. So uh, this is what I think is, is uh, don't think about it as end point. Keep your mind open and go for the next opportunities. Second thing uh, I would say is that if you if you decided that, okay, I'm going to go back to India or I'm going to come back and I'm going to start. Uh, I personally feel that you should start planning. Uh, you should start applying for jobs at least six months or at least three months before you finish your fellowship. Right. So that, you know, yeah, so that you, you start, you start with uh, LinkedIn, you start with networking back with your uh, colleagues or your mentors back in India and you start applying for jobs at least three months before you finish your fellowship. That's a selfish question. And you make a mind. <laughs> 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 so uh, and another another thing I would like to say is that uh, whatever whatever skills you learn uh, in your fellowship, uh, the chances are going to be that uh, you have assisted either assisted them or not done it independently in a uh, in an overseas fellowship. So what I would recommend is come back and join a government hospital where you'll have more number of patients to kind of you know refine your skills. Right. So I would recommend coming back to a government facility or somewhere like a tertiary care center where you have a lot of patients and uh, you can practice them before actually going out and uh, going out and doing definitively what you want, what, whatever you want to do, either in private practice or government practice. But come back and join a government hospital and uh, practice uh, refine your skills. That is the second thing I would like to say. Uh, and uh, third thing is that, you know, uh, is do not jump do not jump into conclusions very fast do not jump into conclusions like abhi bahut late ho gaya hai abhi you know you got to start your practice early because that that narrative is changing when we were in residency there were some people who were telling us ki jitna jaldi practice shuru karoge utna acha hai which is a nice thought but i have a difference of opinion i think it is uh, it is very important to uh, start like you know uh, prepare well before you start your uh, practice in india so take your time, even if you have to do like a job in government hospital or a tertiary care center, refine your skills and then go out uh, to the practice. So I think that is how you should plan, you know, like the end of your fellowship.
Right. Thanks. I think we have uh, lost Dr. Nikhil, but uh, like like you said, endpoint planning can is important. The, yeah, we can hear you. The con connection is a bit sketchy. Do you okay. want me to send a new invite? Uh, well, I really don't know what the uh, problem is, but if, I, if you can hear me, I, I think... Yeah, I, we, can, we can hear you. Your, your thoughts on endpoint yes. planning and... Uh, Correct. Yeah. So, I, for me personally, uh, I had kept those two endpoints which I previously mentioned as well. My uh, uh, bosses uh, here at uh, me that uh, uh, 32 is like a, a you know, good age to uh, start. So, five years after my... Uh, MS 5 or 6 years later, I decided to you know, uh, give learning whatever I wanted. Clinical work, and as I mentioned, that uh, once I felt that if I had to put it on my. Uh, sorry, Dr. Nikhil, we are not able to hear you. Uh, I'll continue with Dr. Prashant for now. The audio is a bit unclear. I'll come back to you once you have a steady connection. So, uh, Again, Dr. Prashant, uh, how, how well is your fellowship serving you in your initial years of practice? Any teething pangs? Uh, how, how's it going so far? Uh, first things, I'm getting direct refuse. I'm getting people are coming to me that, okay, uh, this is, uh, I'm, so I'm, right now I'm working in Bandra Baba Hospital, which is like a secondary uh, level institute in, um, uh, in, uh, in Mumbai. So I'm, I'm, I think uh, with fellowships, what happens, and I think number one, that is what I've uh, realized that it makes uh, a difference that way uh, in terms of reference. Uh, second thing I would say is that in terms of uh, in terms of counseling them, uh, I feel way more confident. Uh, of course, with years of practice, uh, but I think uh, having worked in shoulder and knee for such a long time, mm -hmm. uh, not for such a long time, but two to three years uh, of extra experience, I think it has given me uh, uh, in my in my judgment, clinical judgment making, or uh, I would say counseling the patient, it has definitely helped me out. Uh, uh, I, I, I think I'm able to talk to patients very well. I'm able to counsel them. I'm able to tell them, even if it's a non-operative treatment, I'm not doing the surgery on someone, but at least I'm making sure I'm, 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 I make sure that I'm giving them enough evidence and scientific evidence and why I'm doing this. And, uh, you know, at the same time, another thing which I've seen uh, in my residency is uh, people counseling patients saying that, yeah, treatment lega to ekdam achha ho Operation ke baad mein ekdam achha ho So I think that is something which has changed after I worked in South Korea and US. Is that you understand that there's limitation to a clinical science. And uh, I have the the one important thing which I've learned in my residency abroad is uh, counseling the patients. So I tend to tell the people that this surgery is 95% successful. Okay. Or I always quote the data, and uh, uh, which I which I believe even Indian patients really like that they know that their doctors their doctors know what they're talking about and they are not. Uh, extremely uh, confident or overconfident about the treatment protocols. So, uh, two ways in which fellowships have, in my initial practice, I would say has helped. It's number one is I'm getting more referrals of my sp subspecialty, which I wouldn't get uh, if I did not do the fellowship. Number one, right. uh, and number two, I think I uh, my clinical judgment and uh, decision making has improved uh, definitely after the fellowship. Right. Thanks so much uh, for your time. Uh, shout out to uh, Ashok sir from Ortho TV for uh, streaming it on uh, Ortho TV online as well as uh, a live stream on the Ortho Radio Clubhouse room. We're trying to figure out if uh, this session can be available for viewing later on on the Ortho TV app and I'll get back to you with the details. Like I said, uh, I'll make a post about today's uh, discussion on Instagram and instead of DMs, I think the comment section would be a better uh, avenue because the other people can go through what has been already discussed and they don't ask the same questions again. And that's about it. Any uh, closing that's comments? That's absolutely. Prashant? All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, uh, I, I think this has been a great session and, you know, whatever we can do uh, to help out other people, uh, comment section or dms just uh, uh, send us your text and we'll try to we'll try to uh, you know accommodate a maximum of your questions so what i would like to say is uh, request uh, dr nandan is uh, the one article and one uh, youtube talk uh, the uh, the webinar which is on youtube about uh, overseas fellowships if you could share with others i think it's uh, yeah, they have uh, very critical points mm -hmm. about uh, critical points about how to approach the overseas fellowship and thank you so much you're doing a great job and uh, hope to see you when you're back in india for sure. The Korean symbol for love. That's all I can say for you. <laughs>
ठीक <laughs> 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 to talk about the indian fellowships and how they compare with the foreign ones because uh, that was not really what we wanted to cover in today's uh, discussion all, all right. right take and care god speed bye bye